Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, the title of my message tonight is part two of Was It Worth It? Was It Worth It? And I'm talking about the resurrection. You know, the value of the resurrection is not in what God did. It's what you do with what God did. It would be meaningless if you didn't accept it. It'd be meaningless if any, no one responded to God. If no one worked um, uh, on his behalf because of what he did through his son. The crucifixion, I'm going to go back over this a little bit. Some of you were here, Sonny. Some of you may not. But Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection was the most powerful, dynamic action ever taken place on the earth. I believe that it was even more powerful than creation because it took something that was out of God's hands. It took His Son to do it. His son had to put complete trust in the fact that he was going to bear our sin, die the death of the cross, go into the belly of the earth for three days, and yet trust that God, by the Holy Spirit, was going to raise him up on that third day. Thank God it all worked. It all worked because you weren't in the middle of it. I wasn't in the middle of it. If we'd have been in the middle of it, it would have been a mess. But thank God it was between God and Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so because of that, uh, we have to realize and understand, was it really worth it for humanity? And, you know, I, I got to thinking about that and just started going over a list of things that are different because of the resurrection. And when you start realizing, and I, I think as Christians sometimes we just, we just kind of say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, well, I know that, I know that. Yeah, but are you letting it work in your life? That's where the power works. That's where the impact of the resurrection is. Paul prayed over in um, Colossians, uh, no, Philippians chapter uh, 3, verse 10. He said, I pray and I want to know the power of the resurrection. Actually, the Amplified Bible says that I might know the power outflowing from the resurrection. See, it wasn't a one-time act. It's still working today. It still generates power today. It still produces results today because it's working in us. And it's working in our lives. And God's working in our lives. Jesus suffered cruelly on the cross. He, I mean, he was, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. It was a horrible, horrible, cruel death. But the death was not the cruel part. Bearing our sin was the cruel part. For the pure Lamb of God to die and to carry our sin is almost unimaginable. But yet we kind of say, oh yeah, Jesus died for my sins. Yeah. What are you doing about it? Well, I'm just kind of wallowing around in what he died for. Well, that's the whole purpose of him dying was to set you free. Amen? Amen? Let me read you this scripture. I read this Sunday, and I want to read it again. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Listen to this carefully. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. He has put him to grief. That word grief there actually means made him sick. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It pleased the Lord to do what he did. Now look, God's not a masochist. He didn't, he, he didn't enjoy the brutality. He was pleased because what Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, because of the joy that was set before him. 
What joy was set before him? You. You're the joy that was set before him. He didn't do this because he needed to do it. He didn't have to prove anything to his father. He did it so that he could have you. He did it for you. Well, he did it for the world. Now look, get off of that. He did it for you. Because if you get a revelation he did it for you, then you will tell the world. And if you'll focus on that and understand that, that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The, the Amplified Bible says, uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him in time to come, talking about Jesus, he shall see his spiritual offspring. See his spiritual offspring. Listen, right now, Jesus sees you. He sees his spiritual offspring. You've accepted him. You have become a part of the beloved. He sees you. He accepts you because you have become his offspring. We have stepped over into a place called in the word of God being in Christ. We are now his offspring. Recreated in Christ Jesus. Born anew. To do those good works which he predestined and planned ahead of time for us to walk in. Isn't that awesome? I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to prove that it was worth it. I, I can't prove it by my works. I can prove it by receiving what, it, what he did for me. By walking in what he did for me. By making that the highlight of my life. That is my new life. That's the highlight of my life that I am, I am going to prove that what Jesus did was worth it. Because it was worth it to me. It was worth everything to me. So you have to understand what it was, what was it worth it. And you know, a flippant little cute answer isn't going to get it. What's going to prove whether it was worth it in your life is how you live it. And I think sometimes we just kind of we just kind of say, well, I'm gonna die and go to heaven. Well, good. Now, I'm gonna talk to you about that maybe Sunday or maybe next Sunday. Because one of the values of what Jesus did for us was eternal life, but we have a funny idea about eternal life. I'd like to just preach it tonight, but we, we think, oh well, you know, you get born again, you live like the devil, and you die and you go to heaven. I'm just telling you, folks, you better wake up and smell the coffee if you think that. That is not true, and that does not taught in the Word of God. Well, I'm a Christian. Then act like one. <laughs> You're pretty blunt. Well, I don't throw things, but I'm still pretty blunt. Listen to this very carefully, because it doesn't matter where you are in your life tonight, that resurrection is still transforming. It doesn't matter if you backslid, it doesn't matter if you hadn't been serving God, it doesn't matter whether you've never served God, that power is still available today to take you to the next step. That's a wonderful thing about God. That's a wonderful thing about what He did for us, is that it is an ongoing, reproducing, working action for our lives and it's our goal our job as believers to know what the encompassing of what he did for us and make it our determination to walk in what he did for us to be who he made us to be to live the life he let us live and listen the great thing about it is you don't have to do it in in your own self trying to make it happen all you've got to do is just make up your mind you're going to walk by faith and do what he said Live the life He has for you. Let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Let Him empower you. The eternal value of the resurrection, when examined, stands alone as the only force that continually brings transformation and freedom to those who are willing to step out in faith and believe in the mighty power of the resurrection. Still working today. 
hasn't even lost one iota of power. Well, pastor, people are just not serving God like they used to. It ain't got anything to do with God's power. It has to do with choices. Because the message is still being preached. And I understand Satan blinds people's minds. But let me tell you something I found out about the devil. He can't blind your heart. He can mess with your mind, but God goes past your mind into your heart. My mind said, October the 17th, 1974, I ain't letting go of this pew. I am not walking down to the front. I will not do that. I know the routine. I know what will happen. I'll have to change. I'm not going to do it. But you know what? My heart overrode my head, and I walked down to the front of that church and started operating out of my heart instead of out of my head. And that's what God's looking for. That's what he's looking for. That's transformation power. And its same power works today. This past Sunday, we saw it work in people's lives. People got saved. It worked in their lives. It, it still works the same. Well, I'm, I've been saved, but I'm just having a hard time. That power worked in your hardness, in your hard time. God's given us every provision. Peter said, everything that pertains to life and godliness belongs to you. You just got to make up your mind. You want to walk in it and you want to live in it. So Jesus created a whole new life for mankind, his offspring, you. The only thing he didn't do was take us with him. And he couldn't have taken you with him if everybody who was a believer went with him because then there'd be nobody to tell. I don't know whether you've noticed it or not, but angels aren't preaching the gospel today. Only flesh and blood. Why? Because flesh and blood died for us. And we're the representation of that on the earth to communicate what Jesus did. Until he sees fit to come back and say, okay, this is over, let's go. And I know you think your job's important, your kids are important. And all this other stuff you're doing is important. But the most important thing you need to understand is that you are now the offspring of Jesus. And you have a responsibility to communicate the good news to other people. That's why you're still here. And everything else is secondary. Okay. So, even as the old life continued, people still living in the flesh... God created a parallel universe right here on earth. Did you know that? If you don't believe it, just go drag some people in here off the street who don't know anything about God and let them watch you and think, ooh, those people are crazy. What are they doing? You know why? Because they don't live in the same universe you do. They don't live in the same place you do. The goal is to get to their heart where they can. Now, I've told this story million times but it, it, it's a great example of it first time I went to church Becky and I went to church you know and and uh, we went to this church and it was a uh, uh, I, I, it, you know Lakewood John Osteen is Joel's dad it was was pastor and they had a big old B3 Hammond somebody needs to play the B3 Hammond at our church can you play the B3 Hammond can you we need somebody anyway there's something about that instrument but anyway, he was playing it, and his name was Buford. I remember. I could still see him up there playing that Hammond organ and singing. And then, then Brother Osteen got get up there. John Osteen, he'd get up there, and he was preaching, and all I could see was him preaching and spit. I couldn't hear a word he was saying. <laughs> he was just preaching. I couldn't tell you what he preached. So we left. I did not live in that world. That was not my world. And so I left. I am way off of what I was going to preach tonight, but <laughs> anyway. And you know, most of you know the story. You said, Pastor, we've heard this before. Well, I'm telling you again. <laughs> so several weeks went by. Becky and I were invited to a meeting on a Thursday night uh, at another church, and we went. Next thing we know, we're down at the front with our hands raised up, speaking in other tongues and didn't even know what it was. See, that might scare some of you right there because it's not your world. 
but that doesn't mean it's not real. So we went back to Lakewood that next Sunday. Now listen, I, I, I always tell it like this, everybody there had changed. But in reality, I'd stepped over into their world. Just like I'd all been there my whole life. Hey, I'm, hey I'm, I got it. I got it. So God created two parallel worlds here. And you're living in this world, but you're not of this world. Okay? The Bible said Jesus taught it this way. He said the kingdom of God is within. It's in us. Okay? So you have to understand that that's, that's your life. That's what the resurrection did. It produced power for you, but it only is ex working if somebody accepts it. Now, the philosophy of a lot of churches today is we want to be as close to the world as we can so they'll all be comfortable. Then why have church? We don't want to offend anybody, so we're going to do something. I mean, I know churches, they play, you know, the Beatles and they play, you know, secular music for, before the service because they want everybody to be comfortable. I don't want you to be comfortable. Because if you can be comfortable in church, and, and not be convicted or stirred or even upset because it's not your world. But something's got to be different. Right. Something has to be different about you. Something has to be different about me. Where people look at you and say, I know you're in my world, but you don't act like my world. There's a reason. Because I'm partaking of the resurrection. It's my life. It's my way. It's the way I live my life. I'm still here. I have to wear clothes. I have to go to work. I have to do what I have to do. But yet I still live in a different world. Don't ever get caught thinking you're just like everybody else because you're not. The resurrection has changed you. You are different. And you can relate to other people on a, on a, on a natural level, but you better know who you are and where your boundaries are. Because God's created a different place for us to live our life. So Jesus created a whole new life for his offspring by the resurrection. And we, we, we talked about this, but I'm going to just go over it real quick. The first thing he did was he started with a new man. He knew you couldn't do what you needed to do to live for him unless you were, unless you were new, unless you were different, unless change came. I'm not, a better, I'm not a better version of my old self. Okay, Why? Because Jesus said it like this, you have to be born again. Now, you know, people who don't understand that mock it, but once you're born again, you understand it. There's no mocking it once you understand it. Once you know that God's changed your life, all of a sudden, hey, there's, there's no question about it. I understand now. I got it. So, not only did it start with a new man, but out of the old, uh, a whole new offspring rose up with a personal relationship with God. Do you, do you understand the power of that statement? You have the ability to communicate and to commune with the Father yourself anytime. You don't need anybody else. It's you and Him. It's you and Him. Another thing that we did, and I preached all this on Sunday, so I know, I know some of you were here, so I'm not going to preach it again. But another thing that, that happened was that God, um, uh, by the power of the resurrection, created a common fellowship with strangers. Do you understand that now we are members of the body of Christ and it goes across every kind of line you can imagine. There is, no, there, there is no social line. There is no cultural line. There is no financial line, education line to, to, to being a member of the body of Christ. And I, I shared this Sunday, but I've gone all over the world. And I find Christians everywhere. When I was in Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon, just a few weeks ago, I met Christians from Syria, Iraq, Iran, 
places. You say, oh, there ain't no Christians there. Oh, yeah, they're everywhere. Saudi Arabia, do you know that there's, there is a Christian Philippine invasion in Saudi Arabia? They've come over there to work as servants, and they're Christians. You can go anywhere in the world and find a brother or a sister in Christ. And they will treat you like a brother and sister in Christ. By, by and large, they will treat you like a brother and sister in Christ. And they don't even know you. They don't know your mama, your daddy. They don't know how much money you got. They don't know anything about your life, but they will receive you. And if they don't, I question that they're really a believer. I question that they're really a believer. You know, the Word says that we ought to entertain strangers. Why? Well, they may be an angel or they may just be a brother in Christ. Well, I did that and somebody took advantage of me. They will. That's just part of being a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're going to be taken advantage of. If you don't want to be taken advantage of, don't be a Christian. Because the, the things that God has given us and the abilities He's given us and the way to live our life that He has given us, it just it's just part of it. You don't think Judas took advantage of Jesus? He thought he had what he needed. Man, I got the Savior here, and I got money, and he found out it didn't work that way. But the point is, that to me, that is one of the most amazing things in the world, that you can go anywhere in the world and find somebody that is a brother or sister in Christ, and you're part of them. It's just amazing. It's such a joy. Sometimes you can't even speak the language. You have to get somebody to help you. But it's okay. Sometimes they'll feed you something you don't really want to eat. That's why the Bible says if you eat any deadly thing, you drink any deadly thing. Okay. I've had to do that. And I know that um, Paul and Reggie are here to, tonight from Tanzania. I know they have too. All right, I've got to move on here. Okay. One of the other things that I, I'm going to mention, I talked about this in one of the services and didn't get to it in the other service Sunday, so I'm going to jump back in here with it. Out of the old, a whole new offspring rose up, one with compassion never before seen. Do you understand that when God broke your heart open and poured His Spirit into you and made you a new creature in Christ, He poured His compassion and His mercy into your life? And do you know that without that, the world is a hard place? It's a hard place out there. Because people, generally speaking, are not compassionate people. They are not merciful people. If you don't believe it, just read the news about things that are going on around the world and how ruthless people are. Without Jesus, why? Because He brought a compassion. He looked over the crowd and said, I have compassion on them. And he fed them. And then, then the Bible says, let me just read this to you real quick. In 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Listen to this. 1 Peter 3, 8. It says, finally, all of you be of one mind, talking about the body of Christ, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. That's pretty strong. That's what we're supposed to do. There, even in the body of Christ sometimes, there gets to be a judgmental spirit. You know, and we think we have a right to judge people. But really what we have a right to do is have compassion on people. Have mercy on people. Overlook their faults. It says over in Galatians chapter 6, because we all have our little load of oppressive faults. I know you don't think you do, but you do. If you're married, ask your spouse. They'll tell you. <laughs> the point is that it's in you to have compassion on people. It's in you to be kind to people. It's in you to be courteous to people. Now listen, I, I'm just telling you, it is not your nature naturally to be that way. 
then the devil will try to drive you the other way. But if you will understand that that's who you are and that's in you, you'll find yourself looking at people and seeing people in a whole different light. I pulled up one day at a, at a red light and there was a guy had a sign. I don't remember what it said, something about we'll work for money, but you know he didn't really want to work. He was just trying to get money. And I started being judgmental. And you know what the Lord said? Son, he ain't making a living out here. He's, he, he, he needs help. He's not making a living. The least you can do is help him on his way. It's funny. The Lord just doesn't think the same way we do about stuff. I'm not for promoting people's drug habits, but on the other hand, I think sometimes we need to just be a little more sensitive. We need to be sensitive just to our neighbor, or those people that are around us. They may say, say harsh things to you, but where's it coming from? Maybe they're hurt. Maybe you need to back off and say, I'm going to pray for them. I'm not going to retaliate. Why? Because it's in you to do that. It's in you to do that. That's who you are. And I'll tell you, sometimes it's a hard lesson to learn. But let me just tell you something. This will help you with this, okay? You can find out real quick whether you're really walking in the Spirit or not. Not by some great revelation you have, but how you respond to other people. Because if you respond in anger, you respond in bitterness, or you respond and retaliate, you can pretty much sure you're walking in the flesh. It's awfully quiet in this Presbyterian church tonight. <laughs> Amen. So you've got to make up your mind how you're going to live your life. Listen to what 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Why? Because you're his offspring. He laid his life down for you. You're his offspring. You lay your life down for your brethren. I know what you're going to say. They're going to take advantage of me. They will. Amen. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now, see, some people will misread that and say, I, you mean I, I, every person I see who has a need, i got to give what I have? No, that's not what it means at all. It means that if you see somebody that has a need and you have the resources and your heart's starting to tell you to do it, you do it. Well, they don't ever tell me. Well, I know why. Because I'll tell you right now, if you're his offspring, the Bible says if he laid down his life for us, we ought to. That word ought there means it's a debt. You have to repay. Well, we just live by the grace of God. I know, but, but you have debts. <laughs> you don't think you do, but you do. One of them is that you have to lay down your life for your brother. And everybody said amen. amen. All right, just so you understand. Now listen. The key here is don't shut up your heart. The word heart there is really not a good translation in the New King James. The word there means your inner parts. It's where we get our word spleen. It means your gut. Have you ever been moved on the inside? You know, when you were watching all those babies that were starving in Ethiopia and you turned it on that channel and you quick turned it off real quick? Because you knew that's going to pull me. That's what I'm talking about. But if you're sensitive, you'd be amazed at how God can use you to touch somebody's life. And here's the thing. You can't help somebody if you don't have the resources to help them. That's why it says if you have this world's goods or ability to provide, you may not have it. So you, there's not much you can do except you can't pray for them. You can't help them if you know somewhere where they could get a resource. Everybody still here? But listen, 
It's in you to have compassion on people. It's in you to have mercy on people. You are a child of God. You're the offspring of Jesus. And if he did it, you do it. Isn't that good? I don't, I'm ready to go home. Well, I got more. Hallelujah. Listen, you're a Christian. You know this. You know better. I'm just reminding you, stirring you up. Amen. So out of the old, a whole new offspring rose up. Now listen to this. One who lives beyond the stringent, condemning requirements of the law. The law, you know what the law was? Ten Commandments. Okay. Then it was added to. God added other things to it to spell it out. Okay. Now, here's the thing you have to understand about the law. Uh, this country lives by laws. The minute that people are lawless and they get away with it, we're in trouble. And we're in trouble today, by the way. Okay. Because the law foundation that God gave to the children of Israel was a law to keep them until Jesus came. It was never intended to be the fix-all, cure-all. It was something, the Bible actually talks about it like this in Galatians chapter 4. It was literally a, a school teacher to keep them in check until God sent his son so you could live by something else. Now, let me just mention one other thing. A lot of people think that means I don't have to obey the law because now I'm saved. No, we actually live on a higher plane with a different law. And this law actually is more stringent than the Ten Commandments. The only difference is there's not punishment attached to it when you violate it. There's just con conviction. It's called... James called it the perfect law of liberty. I am free, but I live by the law of liberty. Would you like to know what that law is? It's called the law of love. Because if you walk in love, then you're not going to violate the Ten Commandments. You're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to lie to somebody. You're going to honor your father and mother. You're going to obey the commandments out of love, not out of, oh my God, if I don't, I'm dead. Because God had to keep people in check in their flesh. And today, listen, a lot of people say, well, you know, God did away with the Ten Commandments. No, He didn't. No, He didn't. Do you understand that the Ten Commandments still rule the world? It just doesn't rule your world. Go read the Bible. The Bible says that the law was created for the lawless. So they would know they are wrong. That's what laws do. They tell you you are wrong if you do this. And you are going to be punished if you do this. So Jesus comes along and says, I've got a better law for you to live by. I have a more wonderful law for you to live by. It's called the law of love. And it will set you free from the law of sin and death because you'll now walk in a higher place. Not a lower place. Not a different place. A higher place. And the value is on your love life toward others. How you think about others. How you respond to others. How you respect other people. That's the law that we live by now. We're not under the condemning requirements of the law. Because they were impossible to be fulfilled. The Bible says if, there, if the law had been able to do what God wanted him to do, he would have never had to send Jesus. But it couldn't because it was weak in the flesh. In fact, one of the things about the law that's so crazy is that when you give the law, it makes you want to do what it says you're not supposed to do. I 
I had a friend years ago who got, got you know, we were talking about that. And he said, yeah, he said, I got a revelation of that. And he said, I, I want to prove it out. He said, you know, I, we, have a, we have a Christian school at our church. And he said, we've never had a problem with trash or people littering or anything like that. He said, but I put signs up all over the campus. Do not throw trash on the ground. He's a big old, big old. Letter. He said, it got to be the biggest mess you ever saw. You know why? Because people saw that. And they said, you're telling me I can't do it. I'm going to do it anyway. That's the law. And it brings punishment with it. But when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, as Jesus' offspring, you step up to another level. You step up to another place. And now you walk in love. And if you're walking in love, then you are not going to violate the law. Well, what, what if I do? What if I slip? All right, that, there's a good answer for that. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, God's not going to judge you for that. He's going to remind you who you are and expect you to get back where you're supposed to be. But if you choose to live on that lower level, listen to me. A lot of people won't tell you this, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You will be judged by the laws that you continually violate. I can show you in the Word. I don't have time tonight, but I can show you in the Word. You mean I could still be punished? Well, let, let me give you a good example. Go read Revelations chapter 1, 2, and 3. Jesus warned them, if you don't repent, you're in trouble. Why? Because they were continually living, not the life God gave them, the life of the, under the law. You, you, don't kid yourself. Now that doesn't mean, oh, I made a mistake. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rebelling. I'm talking about disobeying and walking in a place that you have no business walking. My goodness. It got awful quiet in here. See, I know you want the easy road. Well, I'm giving you the easy road. Walk in love. Just walk in love. You're not going to violate all that. Just read your Bible and do what it says for you to do. You won't violate it. And it's not law. It's God saying, hey, this is who you are. Just be who you are. Live the life you're supposed to live. Don't keep falling back over in that other life and wonder why things aren't working for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. No, the good news is, now listen to me, the good news is he's given us a different life, another life. I am so glad. I am so glad. I, listen, I, I wasn't a Christian but I, I, I live guilty all the time about how I was living my life. When I left Becky, a long time ago, some people, when did you do that? <laughs> long time ago. I felt miserable, but I did it anyway. I did it anyway. And I, I felt miserable about it. But here's the thing that people do. They learn to live with their misery. Rather than to be free, to live right, to do right, they would rather live with the misery of knowing I ain't doing right. How dumb is that? To live your life knowing what's right, knowing that how you ought to live your life, and you're miserable when you're not, but you don't do it. I don't want to live that way. I do not want to, I know how that feels, and I don't want to live that life. I want to live in that place over in Romans chapter 1, where, uh, chapter 8, verse 1, where it says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the Spirit. That's where I want to live my life. 
that's where I want to live. Because there's life there. Why? Because that's where the offspring live. That's where we live our life. We live our life by the Holy Spirit. We live our life by the Word of God. We live our lives guided by the principles that Jesus has set forth for us to live in our lives. So we don't have to worry about the law. It's always around the corner. Well, I'm free of the law. Then why did Jesus tell you to obey the laws of the land if you're free of it? If it says 70 miles an hour, why don't you drive 90? You'll find out how quick that doesn't work. Same thing's true in the realm of the, of the Spirit. Don't kid yourself into thinking you can just kind of, I'm free, I'm free. Well, why don't you act like you're free? You think I, I, I'm acting like I'm free? To do what I want to do. No, you're free to live the life that God gave you to live. That's what you have been set free from. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I know y'all wish you hadn't come tonight, but it's too late. Too late. <laughs> One other thing I want to share tonight, and I, I really don't have time to get into this, so I'm not going to do it. If I start on this, Y'all be here till 9 o'clock. Let me just say, let me read you another scripture, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and I'm going to just finish with this. Because see, people get, people get confused because they think that this alternate lifestyle you, uh, of, of walking in the Spirit, walking with God, if you want to get over on that other side and live that way, you're going you're gonna to reap the fruit of it. I, I, I shared this one night here recently. Paul, the Apostle Paul said this, uh, I mean, Jesus said this to Paul. He said, Saul, before he was Paul, why are you persecuting me? The Amplified Bible says, this is going to turn out bad for you. Don't do it. I'm just trying to warn you, there are things you can avoid in life. If you just make up your mind to walk the way the Lord wants you to walk. Listen to this scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Listen to this. Paul's talking about himself here, but he said he's made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now just keep that up there a minute. Listen to this. He's not talking about the difference between the old and the new. He's talking about the fact that that the new covenant is not a, a law of, let, of the letter. In other words, you don't do it out of fear God's going to hurt you. You do it because this is what the Holy Spirit says I should do because this is my life. If you're trying to live a Christian life just because you're trying to make yourself do it, you're living the letter of the New Testament. Now listen to what it says. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. Do you know how many people in church today are living a, a, a New Testament law life? They're bound up by what, what you wear, what you don't wear. You can't do this. you got to do this. If you're not baptized this way, if you're not this, if you're not that. Now listen. You get saved, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach you modesty. You don't have, I don't have to tell you what to, what to wear. If I do, something's wrong. Years ago, many, many years ago, 25 years ago probably, at least 25 years ago, maybe longer, there was a lady that got saved in our church. And I'm telling you, God, she got saved. But she dressed very provocative because that's all she'd ever known. She didn't know any better. And she sat on the front row. I had to look at her every service, front row. I had to keep my eyes looking up here. I mean, it was that bad. It was serious. And I, and I know Becky said something to me and other people said something to me. You need to say something. We need to say something about the way she's dressing. And, and I said, just leave her alone and watch God do it. 
And I'm telling you, over a period of time, it was amazing to watch her because I got I, I used to enjoy watching her come in church, not because she was dressed bad, but because of the change. Her dresses got longer. Blouse came up higher. It was amazing. Now, what would have happened if I'd have got up and preached a message about, I tell you what, these women that wear these short dresses, what would that have done? Probably driven her away. She'd probably been embarrassed. Why? Because that would have been the, the letter of the law. Now look, if you know better and you're still dressing like that, I'm going to say something to you. But what I'm going to say is you know better. Why are you doing this? What's motivating you? What, what stirred you up to, to do this? Y'all still here? There's a whole different way of operation. But, but the thing you've got to understand is this is not just necessarily talking about the Old Covenant. The New Testament, it can kill you. It can beat you over the head. It can run you in the ground. I know Christians that, have, that, that I, I've seen them. They've come through our doors and, and there's no condemnation on the way they dress. You know, I, I know people that have had to walk outside and smoke out in the parking lot. I don't think smoking's good, but I'm not going to run you off because you smoke. Now, if you smoke in here, I would. But, but uh, that's not my job. Well, they come to church smelling like smoke. Well, maybe it'll stir somebody else up to smell and think, hey, that smells like hell. I don't want to go there. <laughs> Use it for good, not for bad. But, but why, why would it be my job to, to condemn somebody? Well, you know, they still drink. Look, alcohol is not good for you. It killed both of my parents. It makes you make stupid decisions. It, it, it literally dumbs you down. Okay? So, so listen to me. It's not good for you. Don't do it. But I'm not going to stand up here and preach about it. If the Holy Spirit's convicting you and you're ignoring Him, you're certainly not going to listen to me. You're just going to get mad and go somewhere where they say it's okay. <laughs> I don't want to condemn you into something. I want you to see who you are in Christ and step up to what God wants you to do. Well, I'm having a hard time quitting smoking. Then I'll pray with you. We'll believe God and God will deliver you. Or whatever it is. That's the power of the resurrection. But you've got to know how to live this life. And you, you step over into who he made you to be, and you live that life. I'll never forget, years ago, I was in a, I'd been in a meeting, and I was back in the hotel room, and I was praying. And man, I tell you, the Holy Spirit was just flowing through me. It was wonderful. And, I, and I, I said, I made this statement, and it stuck with me all these years. This is who I am. Woo, this is who I am. I don't care anything about sneaking down to the bar and having a few cocktails. Nobody would ever know the difference. Why? When you go to your room and drink in the Spirit. Why would you want to? You understand what I'm saying? That's the way we, we live our lives. So you have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and guide you. Well, he told me it was all right. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I'm just telling you. Because, look, I, the Holy Spirit always says what the Word says. Well, the Holy Spirit told me it's okay to drink. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. It said don't be drunk with wine. Well, I don't get drunk. I only drink three glasses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. How many? I used to drink, for, I know what three glasses of wine. I know what two glasses of wine. Well, I'm going to just drink one then. Live on the edge if you want to. I don't want to live there. Why do you want to live there? I've been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. I don't want to live that way. So please, understand, God's given us liberty. Paul said over in Galatians, don't use your liberty for an excuse for selfishness. We
we have so much that Jesus has done for us. If we spend our time just trying to get what he's got for us, you're not going to have time for much else. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Y'all get anything out of this? Hallelujah.